Boaz married within his ethnic group and was intensely concerned with anti-Semitism from an early point period in his life. Alfred Krober recounted a story, quote, which Boaz is said to have revealed confidentially, but which cannot be vouched for, that on hearing an anti-Semitic insult in a public cafe, he threw the speaker out of doors and was challenged. Next morning, his adversary offered to apologize, but Boaz insisted that the duel be gone through. Uh, fake or not, the tale absolutely fits the character of the man as we know him in America. Unquote. Uh, that's from Krober's. Um, really quick, the, it, it, it's not just Boaz, but Jews have that saying, never forgive, never forget. And despite this guy apologizing, uh, Boaz, a typical Jew, still wants to duel. And uh, it just really shows that they never forgive or forget over the smallest things. In a, in a comment that says much about Boaz's Jewish identification, as well as his view of Gentiles, Boaz stated in, a re, in response to a question regarding how he could have professional dealings with anti-Semites such as Charles Davenport, quote, If we Jews had to choose to work only, to work only with Gentiles, certified to be 100% free of anti-Semitism, who could we ever really work with? That's Boaz, uh, quoted in a book by Soren. Moreover, as has, as has been common among Jewish intellectuals in several historical eras, Boaz was deeply alienated from and hostile toward, toward Gentile culture, particularly the culture ideal of the Prussian aristocracy. When Margaret Mead wanted to persuade Boaz to let her pursue her research in the South Sea Islands, Quote, she hit upon a sure way of getting him to change his mind. Um, I knew there was one thing that mattered more to Boaz than the direction taken by anthropological research. This was that he should behave like a liberal, democratic, modern man, not like a Prussian autocrat. Unquote. The ploy worked because she had indeed uncovered the heart of his personal values. McDonald concludes that Boaz had a strong Jewish identification and that he was deeply concerned about anti-Semitism. On the basis of the following, it is reasonable to suppose that his concern with anti-Semitism was a major influence in the development of American anthropology. Indeed, it is difficult to avoid the conclusion that ethnic conflict played a major role in the development of American anthropology. Boaz's views conflicted with the, with the then prevalent idea that cultures had evolved in a series of developmental stages labeled savagery, barbarism, and civilization. The stages were associated with racial differences and modern European culture. Was at the highest, excuse me, and modern European culture was at the highest level of this gradation. Wolf describes the attack of the Boasians as calling it into question, quote, the moral and political monopoly of a Gentile elite which had justified its rule with the claim that their superior virtue was the outcome of the evolutionary process, unquote. Boaz's theories were also meant to counter the racialist, racialist theories of Houston, Stuart, Chamberlain, and American eugenicists like Matterson's Grant, whose book, The Passing of the Great Race, was highly critical of Boaz's research on environmental influences, influences on skull size. The result was that, quote, in message and purpose, Boaz's anthropology was an explicitly anti-racist science, unquote. Grant characterized Jewish immigrants as ruthlessly self-interest, whereas American Nordics were committing racial suicide and allowing themselves to be quote, elbowed out of their own land. Grant also believed Jews were engaged in a campaign to discredit racial research. Grant says here, it is well nigh impossible to, excuse me, it is well nigh impossible to publish in the American newspapers any reflection upon certain religions or races which are hysterically sensitive even when mentioned by name. Abroad, conditions are fully as bad as we have the authority 
of one of the most eminent anthropologists in France that the collection of anthropological measurements and data among French recruits at the outbreak of the Great War was prevented by Jewish influence, which aimed to suppress any suggestion of racial difference differentiation in France. That's again Madison Grant on Jews. An important technique of the Boasian school was to cast doubt on general theories of human evolution, such as those implying developmental sequences, by emphasizing the vast diversity and chaotic minitude of human behavior, as well as the relativism of standards of cultural evaluation. The Boasians argued that general theories of cultural evolution must await a detailed cataloging of cultural diversity, but in fact, no general theories emerged from this body of research in the ensuing half-century of its dominance of the profession. Because of its rejection of the fundamental scientific activities such as generalization and classification, Boasian anthropology may thus be characterized more as an anti-theory than a theory of human culture. Boas also opposed research on human genetics, what Derek Freeman terms his obscurinist antipathy to genetics, unquote. Boaz and his students were intensely concerned with pushing an ideological agenda within the American anthropological profession. Boaz and his associates had a sense of group identity, a commitment to a common viewpoint, and an agenda to dominate the institutional structure of anthropology. They were a compact group with a clear intellectual and political agenda rather than individualist seekers of disinterested truth. The defeat of the Darwinian, Darwinian, Darwinians excuse me, quote, had not happened without considerable exhortation of every mother's son standing for the right, nor had it been accomplished without some rather strong pressure applied both to staunch friends and to the weather, weaker brethren, often by the sheer force of Boaz's personality. By 1915, the Boasians controlled the American Anthropological Association and held a two-thirds majority on its executive board. In 1919, Boaz could state that, quote, most of the anthropological work done at the present time in the United States was done by his students at Columbia. By 1926, every major department of anthropology was headed by Boaz students, the majority of whom were Jewish. His protege, Melville Herskovitz, Melville Herskovitz, noted that the four decades of the tenure of Boaz's professor, professorship at Columbia gave a continu- continuity to his teaching that permitted him to develop students who eventually made up the greater part of the significant personal core of American anthropologists and who came to man and direct most of the major departments of anthropology in the United States. In their turn, they, were, they trained the students who have continued the tradition in which their teachers were trained. So, Boaz teaches students, and they go on to teach more Boazian anthropology. According to Leslie White, Boaz's most influential students were Ruth Benedict, Alexander Goldenweiser, Melville, Melville Herskowitz, Alfred Krober, Robert Lowy, Robert Low, Lowy, you know, that's what I said. Margaret Mead, Paul Radin, Edward Sapir, and Leslie Spear. All of this small, compact group of scholars gathered about their leader. They were all Jews, with the exception of Krober, Benedict, and Mead. Frank also mentioned several other prominent first first generation Jewish students of Boaz, who are Alexander Lesser, Ruth Bunzel, Jean Regina Weltfish, Weltfish Esther Schiff Goldfrank, and Ruth Landes. Sapir's fam Sapir I don't know if you say this Jewish name. Sapir's family fed fled the programs in Russia for New York where Yiddish was his first language. Although not religious, he took an increasing interest in Jewish topics early in his career and later became engaged in Jewish activism, 
particularly in establishing a predominant center for Jewish learning in Lithuania. Ruth Land's background also shows the ethnic nexus of the Boasian movement. Her family was prominent in the Jewish leftist subculture of Brooklyn, and she was introduced to Boaz by Alexander Goldenweiser, a close friend of her father and another of Boaz's prominent students. In contrast to the ideological and political basis of Boaz's motivation, Krober's militant environmentalism and defense of the culture concept was, quote, entirely theoretical and professional, unquote. Neither his private nor his public writings reflect the attention to public policy re- questions regarding blacks or the general question of race in American life that are so conspicuous in Boaz's professional cor- correspondence and publications. Krober rejected race as an analytical category as forthrightly and thoroughly as Boaz, but he reached that position primarily through theory rather than ideology. Krober argued that, quote, Our business is to promote anthropology rather than to wage battles on behalf of tolerance in other fields. Ashley Montagu was another influential student of Boaz. Montagu, whose original name was Israel Ehrenberg, was a highly visible crusader in the battle against the idea of racial differences in mental capacities. He was also highly conscious of being Jewish, stating on one one occasion that, quote, if you, were, if you are brought up a Jew, you know that all non-Jews are anti-Semitic. I think it is a good working hypothesis, unquote. And that's Israel Ehrenberg on uh, non-Jews. Montague asserted that race is a socially constructed Socially constructed myth. Humans are innately, innately co- cooperative, and there is a universal brotherhood among humans, a highly problematic idea for many in the wake of World War II. Mention also should be made of Otto Kleinberg, a professor of psychology at Columbia. Kleinberg was, quote, tirelessly and ingenious in his arguments against the reality of racial differences. He came under the influence of Boaz at Columbia and dedicated his 1935 book, Race Differences, to him. Kleinberg, quote, made it his business to do psychology, to do for psychology what his friend and colleague at Columbia, referring to uh, Boaz, had done for anthropology, and that is to rid his discipline of racial explanations for human social differences. It is interesting in this regard that the members of the Boasian school who achieved the greatest greatest pro- public renown were two Gentiles, Benedict and Mead. As in several other prominent historical cases, Gentiles became the publicity vis- the publicly visible spokespersons for a movement dominated by Jews. Indeed, like Freud, Boaz recruited Gentiles into his movement out of concern, quote, that his Jewishness would make his science appear partisan and thus compromised. So, like, everyone would see it as a Jewish movement. Boaz devised Margaret Mead's classic study on adolescence in Samoa with an eye to its usefulness in the nature-nurture debate raging at the time. The result of this research was the book Coming of Age in Samoa, a book that revolutionized American anthropology in the direction 